Flood control is an important issue for the Netherlands, as about two-thirds of its area is vulnerable to flooding. While the country is among the most densely populated on Earth, natural sand dunes and human-made dikes, dams and floodgates provide defense against storm surges from the sea. River dikes prevent flooding from water flowing into the country by the major rivers Rhine and Meuse, while a complicated system of drainage ditches. Canals and pumping stations keep the low-lying parts dry for habitation and agriculture. Water control boards are the independent local government bodies responsible for maintaining this system. In modern times, flood disasters coupled with technological developments have led to large construction works to reduce the influence of the sea and prevent future floods. Original Geography of the Netherlands and TERP Building the flood-threatened area of the Netherlands is essentially an alluvial plain, built up from sediment left by thousands of years of flooding by rivers and the sea. About 2,000 years ago most of the Netherlands was covered by extensive peat swamps. The only areas suitable for habitation were on the higher grounds in the east and south and on the dunes and natural embankments along the coast in the rivers. In several places the sea had broken through these natural defences and created extensive floodplains in the north. The first permanent inhabitants of this area were probably attracted by the sea-deposited clay soil which was much more fertile than the peat and sandy soil further inland. To protect themselves against floods they built their homes on artificial dwelling hills called Turpin or Weirden. Between 500 BC and 700 AD there were probably several periods of habitation and abandonment as the sea level periodically rose and fell. Dike construction in coastal areas The first dikes were low embankments of only a meter or so in height surrounding fields to protect the crops against occasional flooding. Around the 9th century the sea was on the advance again and many turps had to be raised to keep them safe. Many single turps had by this time grown together as villagers. These were now connected by the first dikes. After 1000 AD the population grew, which meant there was a greater demand for arable land but also that there was a greater workforce available and dike construction was taken up more seriously. The major contributors in later dike building were the monasteries. As the largest landowners they had the organization, resources and manpower to undertake the large construction. By 1250 most dikes had been connected into a continuous sea defense. The next step was to move the dikes ever more seawards. Every cycle of high and low tide left a small layer of sediment. Over the years these layers had built up to such a height that they were rarely flooded. It was then considered safe to build a new dike around this area. The old dike was often kept as a secondary defense, called a sleeper dike. A dike couldn't always be moved seawards. Especially in the southwest river delta it was often the case that the primary sea dike was undermined by a tidal channel. A secondary dike was then built, called in Layag Dike. With an inland dike, when the seaward dike collapsed, the secondary inland dike becomes the primary. Although the redundancy provides security, the land from the first to second dike is lost over the years the loss can become significant. Taking land from the cycle of flooding by putting a dike around it prevents it from being raised by silt left behind after a flooding. At the same time the drained soil consolidates and peat decomposes leading to land subsidence. In this way the difference between the water level on one side and land level on the other side of the dike grew. While floods became more rare, if the dike did overflow or was breached the destruction was much larger. The construction method of dikes has changed over the centuries. Popular in the Middle Ages were wire dike and earth dikes with a protective layer of seaweed. An earth embankment was cut vertically on the sea-facing side. Seaweed was then stacked against this edge, held into place with poles. In places where seaweed was unavailable other materials such as reeds or wicker mats were used. Another system used much and for a long time was that of a vertical screen of timbers backed by an earth bank. 
Technically these vertical constructions were less successful as vibration from crashing waves and washing out of the dike foundations weakened the dike. Much damage was done to these wood constructions with the arrival of the shipworm, a bivalve thought to have been brought to the Netherlands by VOC trading ships that ate its way through Dutch sea defences around 1730. The change was made from wood to using stone for reinforcement. This was a great financial setback as there is no natural occurring rock in the Netherlands and it all had to be imported from abroad. Current dikes are made with a core of sand, covered by a thick layer of clay to provide waterproofing and resistance against erosion. Dikes without a fall and have a layer of crushed rock below the waterline to slow wave action. Up to the high waterline the dike is often covered with carefully laid basalt stones or a layer of tarmac. The remainder is covered by grass and maintained by grazing sheep. Sheep keep the grass dense and compact the soil, in contrast to cattle, developing the peat swamps. At about the same time as the building of dikes the first swamps were made suitable for agriculture by colonists. By digging a system of parallel drainage ditches water was drained from the land to be able to grow grain. However the peat settled much more than other soil types when drained and land subsidence resulted in developed areas becoming wet again. Cultivated lands which were at first primarily used for growing grain thus became too wet and the switch was made to dairy farming. A new area behind the existing field was then cultivated, heading deeper into the wild. This cycle repeated itself several times until the different developments met each other and no further undeveloped land was available. All land was then used for grazing cattle. Because of the continuous land subsidence it became ever more difficult to remove excess water. The mouths of streams and rivers were dammed to prevent high water levels flowing back upstream overflowing cultivated lands. These dams had a wooden culvert equipped with a valve, allowing drainage but preventing water from flowing upstream. These dams however blocked shipping and the economic activity caused by the necessity to transship goods caused villages grow up near the dam. Some famous examples are Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Only in later centuries were locks developed to allow ships to pass. Further drainage could only be accomplished after the development of the Polder windmill in the 15th century. The wind-driven water pump has become one of the trademark tourist attraction of the Netherlands. The first drainage mills using a scoop wheel could raise water at most 1.5 meter. By combining mills the pumping height could be increased. Later mills were equipped with an Archimedes screw which could raise water much higher. The polders, now often below sea level, were kept dry with mills pumping water from the polder ditches and canals to the Boesm, a system of canals and lakes connecting the different polders and acting as a storage basin until the water could be let out to river or sea, either by a sluice gate at low tide or using further pumps. This system is still in use today, though drainage mills have been replaced by first steam and later diesel and electric pumping stations. The growth of towns and industry in the Middle Ages resulted in an increased demand for dried peat as fuel. First all the peat down to the groundwater table was dug away. In the 16th century a method was developed to dig peat below water, using a dredging net on a long pole. Large-scale peat dredging was taken up by companies, supported by investors from the cities. These undertakings often devastated the landscape as agricultural land was dug away and the leftover ridges, used for drying the peat, collapsed under the action of waves. Small lakes were created which quickly grew in size. Every increase in surface water leading to more leverage of the wind on the water to attack more land. It even led to villages being lost to the waves of human-made lakes. The development of the polder mill gave the option of draining the lakes. In the 16th century this work was started on small, shallow lakes, continuing with ever larger and deeper lakes. 
though it wasn't until in the 19th century that the most dangerous of lakes, the Harlem Ermier near Amsterdam, was drained using steam power. Drained lakes and new polders can often be easily distinguished on topographic maps by their different regular division pattern as compared to their older surroundings. Millwright and hydraulic engineer Jan Leeg-Water has become famous for his involvement in these works. Control of river floods Three major European rivers, the Rhine, Meuse and Scheldt flow through the Netherlands of which the Rhine and Meuse cross the country from east to west. The first large construction works on the rivers were conducted by the Romans. Nero Claudius Drusus was responsible for building a dam in the Rhine to divert water from the river branches Val to the Nadarene and possibly for connecting the river Isel, previously only a small stream, to the Rhine. Whether these were intended as flood control measures or just for military defense and transportation purposes is unclear. The first river dikes appeared near the river mouths in the 11th century where incursions from the sea added to the danger from high water levels on the river. Local rulers dammed branches of rivers to prevent flooding on their lands, only to cause problems to others living further upstream. Large-scale deforestation upstream caused the river levels to become ever more extreme while the demand for arable land led to more land being protected by dikes giving less space to the river stream bed and so causing even higher water levels. Local dikes to protect villages were connected to create a bound dike to contain the river at all times. These developments meant that while the regular floods for the first inhabitants of the river valleys were just a nuisance, in contrast the later incidental floods when dikes burst were much more destructive. The 17th and 18th century was a period of many infamous river floods resulting in much loss of life. They were often caused by ice dams blocking the river, land reclamation works, large willow plantations and building in the winter bed of the river all worsened the problem. Next to the obvious clearing of the winter bed, overflows were created. These were intentionally low dikes where the excess water could be diverted downstream. The land in such a diversion channel was kept clear of buildings and obstructions, as this so-called Green River could therefore essentially only be used for grazing cattle it was in later centuries seen as a wasteful use of land. Most overflows have now been removed, focusing instead on stronger dikes and more control over the distribution of water across the river branches. To achieve this canals such as the Panagens Canal and New Amervad were dug. A committee reported in 1977 about the weakness of the river dikes, but there was too much resistance from the local population against demolishing houses and straightening and strengthening the old meandering dikes. It took the flood threats in 1993 and again in 1995, when over 200,000 people had to be evacuated and the dikes only just held to put plans into action. Now the risk of a river flooding has been reduced from once every 100 years to once every 1,250 years. Further works in the room for the river project are being carried out to give the rivers more space to flood and in this way reducing the flood. Height Water Control Boards The first dikes and water control structures were built and maintained by those directly benefiting from them, mostly farmers. As the structures got more extensive and complex councils were formed from people with a common interest in the control of water levels on their land, and so the first water boards began to emerge. These often controlled only a small area, a single polder or dike. Later they merged or an overall organization was formed when different water boards had conflicting interests. The original water boards differed much from each other in organization, power and area they managed. The differences were often regional and dictated by differing circumstances. Whether they had to defend a sea dike against a storm surge or keep the water level in a polder within bounds. In the middle of the 20th century there were about 2,700 water control boards. After many mergers there are currently 27 water boards left. Water boards hold separate elections, levy taxes and function independently from other government bodies. 
The dikes were maintained by the individuals who benefited from their existence, every farmer having been designated part of the dike to maintain, with a three-yearly viewing by the water board directors. The old rule, whom the water hurts, he the water stops, meant that those living at the dike had to pay and care for it. This led to haphazard maintenance and it is believed that many floods would not have happened or would not have been as severe if the dikes had been in better condition. Those living further inland often refused to pay or help in the upkeep of the dikes though they were just as much affected by floods. While those living at the dike itself could go bankrupt from having to repair a breach dike, Reich's water start was set up in 1798 under French rule to put water control in the Netherlands under a central government. Local water boards however were too attached to their autonomy and for most of the time Reich's water start worked alongside the local water boards. Reichswater Start has been responsible for many major water control structures and was later and still is also involved in building railroads and highways. Water boards may try new experiments like the sand engine off the coast of North Holland. Notorious floods Over the years there have been many storm surges and floods in the Netherlands. Some deserve special mention as they particularly have changed the contours of the Netherlands. A series of devastating storm surges, more or less starting with the first All Saints flood in 1170 washed away a large area of peat marshes, enlarging the Wadden Sea and connecting the previously existing Lake Almira in the middle of the country to the North Sea, thereby creating the Zouderzee. It in itself would cause much trouble until the building of the Afslut Dyke in 1933. Several storms starting in 1219 created the Dollet from the mouth of the River Ems. By 1520 the Dollet had reached its largest size. Riederland, containing several towns and villages, was lost. Much of this land was later reclaimed. In 1421 the Saint Elizabeth's flood caused the loss of de Grotewaard in the southwest of the country particularly the digging of peat near the dike for salt production and neglect because of a civil war caused dikes to fail. It created the Bees Bosch, a valued nature reserve. The more recent floodings of 1916 and 1953 gave rise to building the Afslut Dike and Delta Works respectively. Also see list of settlements lost to floods in the Netherlands. Flooding as military defense. By flooding certain areas on purpose a military defensive line could be created. In case of an advancing enemy army the area was inundated with about 30 centimeters of water, too shallow for boats but deep enough to make advance on foot difficult, hiding underwater obstacles as canals, ditches and purpose-built traps. Dikes crossing the flooded area and other strategic points were protected by fortifications. The system proved successful on the Hollandic water line in Ramp Jar 1672 during the Third Anglo-Dutch War but was overcome in 1795 because of heavy frost. It was also used with the Stelling van Amsterdam, the Greber line and the Isel line. The advent of heavier artillery and especially airplanes have made this strategy largely obsolete.